Good afternoon. Welcome to Inspiring Entrepreneurs Montreal, showcasing stories from outstanding business people by BDO Canada. My name is Dan Delmar, along with Mike Newton of BDO. Hello, Mike. Hey, Dan. How are you? Excellent. How are you? Very good. Thank you. What a fun show we have today. It's almost summer. And so uh, our profile is Alex Archambault of La Croix Boards, uh, electric skateboards. They've electrified a surfboard and they've even created this harpoon contraption for extreme skiers. You don't need a chairlift anymore. You just use the harpoon. And you kind of make your own chairlift in, when you're skiing out in the wild. It's just a, a really fun and uh, adventurous line of products. Yeah, I'm a little bit of an adrenaline junkie. I wish I was 20 years younger right now or, or else 55 like I am in a better shape. But either way, some of these things are fascinating. I mean, I you know, you just look at the ability to to not be part of the masses while you're doing your own thing and, and, and you know, kind of get that adrenaline rush going. So, yeah, we'll get into these products. But, yeah, it's really, really cool. The, the surfboard product looks so cool. I mean, you're kind of surfing, uh, hovering really uh, above above the lake, about a couple feet above the lake. It's uh, it's really fun. So Alex will explain uh, the products, how they're all connected. And we'll talk about research and development as well. Uh, Carlo Lupo, our tax uh, expert, will, uh, will join us about the tax credits available for companies who are innovating as well. Do you think, Dan, I can get uh, Alex to design some uh, the equivalent of training wheels for the, for that uh, hydrofoil? Because my sense of balance is not so good. I think yeah, I think some balance is required on that one. Yeah, uh, yeah. I think I'm uh, I, I'm out of luck on that. Even the skateboard seems a bit tough. Uh, Alex was saying, um, you know, you'll you'll learn how they came up with the name La Croix. It has to do with the the cross on the mountain and how that became a training ground for some of his products. So looking forward to the chat with Alex on the way. We do have one more show uh, after this one before the end of our season. And uh, as we mentioned last week, we can confirm that Inspiring Entrepreneurs is back for a 15th season on CJAD in the fall in September. So we're super excited about that. And uh, what a season, Mike. We had a lot of interesting entrepreneurs and um, our, our names are getting more interesting. Our products are getting more innovative. And uh, that is reflected certainly on the show today. Let's get to some news and notes, and uh, everyone is talking in the business community about the CRA strike, of course. It affects other uh, government departments, but mainly um, uh, Revenue Canada for businesses. As far as the deadlines go, Mike, no change there. Revenue Canada is communicating very clearly, as is Quebec, that you you must uh, stick to the deadlines. Most definitely, the deadline is still May 1st uh, because April 30th falls on a Sunday. And I got to tell you, it's not from lack of trying from a lot of uh, accountants, tax preparers, and CPAs who have been laundering the, uh, you know, the, the government uh, to try and find a way to, to push this out. Um, and, and, and I'm not sure if the attempt to push it out is more based on the, uh, shall we call it the procrastination of the to wait until last minute, or whether there's anything from uh, from the government perspective that, that is posing this. I, but I know that the ability to connect online and do what we would normally do has not yet been affected. Um, but uh, I think there will be some uh, some effects coming from depending on where they settle uh, on this strike. So, in other words, business as usual would be the the safe assumption in terms of your dealings with CRA. Yeah, I, you know, CRA, and as we mentioned uh, in in past shows, uh, you know, in Quebec we deal with two governments, so certainly Quebec is not deferred and is is definitely not even going to consider it. So, you know, regardless of of what the scenario is on the federal side, you'd still have to. And you know, we're we're going to we're we're sitting as April 29th at this point, so uh, I don't see any changes coming in the next 48 hours. So get your tax returns in, get things done, and 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 move forward. Put it behind mm-hmm. us. The other interesting angle on this story is the demands. So they're 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 demanding a salary increase, of course. You know that's pretty normal. They're also demanding more hybrid work and remote work, which I which I think is worth talking about because we've debated this uh, a lot, Mike, on the show. I'm more team hybrid. Uh, you're certainly very skeptical of team hybrid, but when we're talking about CRA agents, you know, especially the ones that are having sort of like client relations roles or that are often just in front of their computers. Is that not the type of worker that we can uh, have at home at least most of the time? 
Yeah, you know, and it's an interesting discussion because, you know, if you listen to the higher ups within the federal and the Quebec government about trying to build the relationship with taxpayers, it's still going to be hard to do from a hybrid environment. Um, what we have seen in the last year and, and particularly in the last six months is uh, a plethora of desk audit requests of certain information. So I don't think you're ever going to replace uh, the full blown audit of having to be there. I think, you know, the auditor needs to be able to see body language and communicate with, you know, w- with somebody. But we're going to continue to see a lot more of this desk audit, which is they're, they're going to pick a couple of areas in your tax returns, whether that's corporate or personal, and say, provide us the backup for ABC. And, uh, you know, if we need to, we'll dig deeper. And if not, well, at least they're getting it. So all of that work can certainly be done remotely. Um, and, and I think part of the problem, certainly from the remote work environment, comes in you know, not like, not like, uh, you know, a lot of corporate environment where you can set up outside of the city. Most of the major government offices are downtown. And, and we all know that the, the downtown, um, trek, uh, has been a challenge in the last three years have proven that, uh, you know, we don't need to spend an hour in traffic or on the metro or taking a bus in order to be efficient. So I, I, I will be, I will be shocked if, if this is not a piece to a certain degree within whatever gets settled at the end of the day. I have a funny feeling that what we're going to see is uh, the government, uh, you know, give and be a little more uh, open to the remote work as they try to keep the salary ranges, uh, salary ranges down. I think they're going to have to be. And that leads me to my next question that it does affect salary and uh, and real estate too. a couple of areas um, that uh, remote or hybrid work can can affect in terms of an organization's operations. First, is it fair that someone who comes in full time in in person in the office gets paid the same as their peer who does not? There's there's that question. And then there's also real estate. Is it time to shrink the size of offices, have more shared desks, and thereby reducing costs for organizations as well? Well, you've hit the uh, topic that we've been battling with since uh, since we we you know we stuck our head out of the uh, first few months of uh, of COVID rabbit hole is you know do we need the the footprint that we needed before and uh, is it is it fair that, you know, you're going to work from home and you're going to do your own thing? And, you know, we're not going to, uh, we're not going, I mean, most people, let's be honest, get to work on their own dime. Uh, you know, why should the, the, the there, there's got to be some kind of adjustment. There's got to be some kind of perk. Otherwise people aren't going to. And, and I think a lot of the resistance for people to come to the office is revolving around that. I can make the same dollar working from home as I can come to the office. If there's going to be either a premium and, and, and funny enough, I don't think there will be a penalty. I think there'll have to be a premium. Uh, uh, to bring people to the office in order to do so. And, you know, it's it, it's interesting. You hear some of the stories of, uh, you know, environment, some of the professional offices that have had younger staff. And, you know, I remember speaking to uh, speaking to somebody one day and said, so, you know, is your staff back in the office? And he said, yeah, they come in on Fridays. And I said, Fridays, that's one of those days. And he says, yeah, because all the younger people get the parking paid on Fridays, they come out and then they go out for dinner and go for a few drinks and do their own thing and have their Friday night out. So, you know, people are building a life around uh, when they're in the office. And, and I do I do agree there's going to have to be a, uh, some kind of just not disproportion, but some kind of uh, benefit to bringing people to the office. Otherwise, it's just going to be us old guys. One recommendation uh, for those entrepreneurs who are uh, into AI and maybe they playing around with chat GPT. Uh, there's a guy on uh, the Internet called Mr. Prompts. Uh, his name is Adit Sheth. And you can find him on Twitter. The key, Mike, we were talking about this last week. If you're playing around with chat GPT or other predictive AI, the key to getting the best information possible, not necessarily super accurate, you have to still check it over, but the, the key to getting the best answer possible is prompts or what you put into the system. How you ask the question is very important. And uh, I'll recommend Mr. Prompts here because he uh, offers advice for a, a number of ways to automate everyday life. Here, I'll, I'll share some examples. Explain things to me like I'm 11 years old. You know, like something like that to understand a simple concept is one way that it could boil things down for you. Another is create terms and services for my website about an AI tool called blank. It'll create the terms and services for you in an instant. Another could be, I want you to act as a recruiter. I'll provide responsibilities about the job and it will be your job to come up with these strategies for sourcing qualified applicants. Another one is generate a creative social media calendar for the next week. And you can see all these little administrative tasks, Mike, uh, can be automated uh, to some degree uh, if you know how to use the right prompts. Well, I think there's two things that come to mind. One is this is a massively advanced version of what we used to, you know, the search engine. I mean, ultimately, at the end of the day, for anybody who's ever used Google, 
uh, or, or or any other search engine, the the efficiency with which you get information is a function of the information that you put in. And, you know, this is obviously taking things to a new level, but it, it, it conceptually, it's no different, right? It's, you know, the old garbage in, garbage out mentality. And I think Chad GPT, uh, as well as a search engine, are going to function on a similar basis is, you know, if you if you can narrow down... It, I, I, and I take a step back here because I'm still shocked that there are people in today's world that cannot Google properly. And, you know, the fact that that is it, it is a verb in and of itself means that people should know how to use it. I am shocked at the garbage that people put into Google and how long it takes them to find something relevant. And I'm thinking, how can that, these people are going to have a huge amount of trouble in chat GPT going forward, you know, if they can't they, they can't use it. So to me, this is a this is a huge issue. And it and it's not dissimilar, you know, when you think about it to the conversations we have face to face, right? If I don't narrow down or I don't ask a very pointed specific question, your brain is going to process it and give me the answer which on which you've interpreted that information that I've provided to you, which again is no different than Googling, which is not really any different than the chat GPT kind of search model that, that we're looking at. And, you know, when people start to look at it that way, I think they get the concept of what they're talking. I mean, somebody thinks they can just throw whatever they want in a search engine and it's going to figure it out for them. You know what? It's the same as having a conversation. If I don't ask you a, a lucid, pointed question, how is Dan going to answer that properly? It's all about the prompts. And if a system understands really ones and zeros, you can't talk to it like it's your buddy, right? It's it's It doesn't understand that. Correct. It's yes. It's it's machine. It's it's going to be based on machine learning, and the more it goes on, and the more that they 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 get to conceptualize and and bring that information in. But it's still a form of communication, and and you know I, I think it's just something that that, that we should not be uh, uh, you know forgetting is you know you need to communicate with a human the same way as you need to communicate with a machine. And if you ask the wrong question, you're gonna likely get the wrong answer. Things are happening so fast, Mike. I I feel like when by the time we get back with a new season in the fall. There'll be a brand new search tool that kind of upends everything we know about searching, and that's just a different interface. And uh, you know, even a, a few months, I think we'll we'll be we'll be surprised at how fast uh, searching has developed. Well, after you listen to today's guest, I'm I'm afraid that by the time we come back in se September, I'm going to be sitting on a hoverboard, uh, and uh, you know, we're going to be asking each other questions, uh, and I don't even know what's going to be uh, face to face anymore. You know, the technology certainly is going at an exorbitant speed, um, but it brings back to you know the conversations we've had repeatedly with a number of our guests is, you know, where do you draw the line? Where are the morals? Where are the ethics? Where is this going to be taking us? And how is we, how are we going to to use it? You know, and and when when we were looking at the today's show and he was talking about you know the board hovering you know what do i think i think i go back to uh you know some of the the sci-fi movies where the cars were floating above the road you know what we're certainly not that far away from a lot of things tech can be used to get you out into nature and to get you away from the screen and we'll talk about some of those products uh the skateboard the hoverboard surfboard product it looks really fun and let's get right to our guest i'm really excited for this one mike somewhere's around the corner uh, alex archambault is the ceo of la croix boards alex welcome to cjad hello nice to be here thanks for having me so you have a really interesting line of products now um, at least three products that are trying to take our summer sports to the next level uh what is la croix boards La Croix is a company I founded five years ago when I was a patent lawyer uh, back then. I actually built myself a, an electric skateboard to go to the firm when I was where I was working in the old Montreal. And uh, it basically took off. I decided to uh, found a company to kind of have a sideline, but it became uh, the main line quite quickly. And so five years ago, I left my job as a uh, patent lawyer and started um, building electric skateboards in my built uh, in my basement. Two months later, we moved into the Mile End, and now we have a, a 5,000 square foot um, shop in the Laurentians where we build three lines of products. One, the skateboards, which is still the bread and butter, and then we've launched a new um, e-foil product, which is kind of a surfboard that floats above the water last fall. And this winter, we just uh, launched a, a, another new product, which is a miniature hyper strong ski winch ski lift if you will that could pull uh, two skiers 
So I'm going to go back a step. I mean, your your your, your life as a lawyer, uh, patent law. Um, how much of how much of that? I mean, obviously, some of the things you're doing uh, are, were patentable, uh, and uh, maybe just discuss the importance. I mean, there's a lot of people that start in, on on you know the ventures uh, and forget the whole side of uh, of getting patent development and the, uh, the I guess the the strength and the need for that. Yeah, I guess it's kind of. Um ingrained in me and I will always think about it and I'm, I'm I'm thankful for that because while the skateboard products are well techni- technically you you can certainly find innovations and things to protect in each and every product but it it's always a question of its if it's um commercially viable and um if you should do it and so the the skateboard products, for example, they they change too much on a season to season basis. So we have not asked for any protection. While on the efoil products and the winter products, the harpoon, which we call it, those are completely innovative. We don't right. see them changing materially within the next few years. Of the, I mean, mind you, we're going to do some improvements, but the base core product is really novel, and so we've we've filed for protections on both of those. So for people who don't actually have this background, it, it's good to kind of have a a sounding board without engaging a lot of costs, but at least have a a good um, a patent lawyer or trademark agent, someone that could simply give you a few pointers so that the entrepreneur can decide if it's worth it or not to actually ask for a protection. And part and part of the protection, I think people need to recognize is you know each each country is a different jurisdiction, so you know you're if, if for in your case uh, you know I mean you're probably not uh, not necessarily to worry about Mexico, um, but Europe is a big place and and people when they're starting off with a lot of these projects are always you know the the natural instinct is to protect it in Canada and by the time they look at trying to look elsewhere it may be too late. Yes, you're you're absolutely right. So there are some. Some the rules will differ depending on the countries and the continents, but as a rule of thumb, each country has its own specific set of rules for protection. Now, there is a uniform kind of a, a uniform system, which we call the Patent Cooperation Treaty, which which deals with a, a set of rules for a whole bunch of countries. But yeah, um, it, it is certainly worth it to explore the markets in which you really think where your product is going to be uh, sold. So for for the majority of people, that means protecting in the U.S. But when you go into Europe, you can't just file for Europe as a whole. You, you're you're going to need to file in each and every country. So that kind of it's all. If you're if you're thinking of going to Europe, then it it's, it would be worth it to get the advice of of a professional because the strategy might differ a bit from the U.S., which is kind of more cut and dry. It certainly helps having a good patent expert on the team when you have such interesting products. I mean, let's let's talk about the three products, starting with the newest and, and I think what is the most interesting for uh, certainly adventure sport enthusiasts, a harpoon that basically allows skiers to become their own chairlift. Tell me how this works. Yes. So the idea came when I was talking to a professional snowboarder from out west, and he was telling me that they build these huge kickers, these huge jump in the middle of the Rockies, which they access usually by helicopter or by plane. And the, but then they 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 need to hike back up 10, 12, 15 times in the day and they get exhausted and then they can get hurt because they're 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 exhausted. So uh his name was Mason, Mason Michon. And he um he asked me, well Alex, do you do you think there's a way for you to build some kind of a remote and uh, like kind of a a, a ski lift and then a like okay with your battery technology and so I, I basically you know went crazy with it for about a month i couldn't sleep i was just researching anything any business that had to do with ropes because the because the you know we had a I, I had a few very important criteria it needed to be super light the rope needed to be tiny yet super strong it needed to be impervious to the weather uh to sunlight it needed to be able to be transported in a backpack, but and so then again, the weight would be super important. And so, long story short, after doing a whole bunch of research, the harpoon is basically a combination of a self-tailing winch off a super yacht combined with the transmission off of a super high-powered electric skateboard. So that's basically, yeah, the mix of both. 
And and to think, Dan, when I first started to to research, I wasn't uh, I wasn't aware of Lacroix boards. I actually thought we were going to be talking about uh, corporate boards today. So see, there you learn something new every day. Now we've got uh, a winch that's going to pull me up the hill. It better be strong based on the lack of exercise I've done lately. But now hang on, we have to dig into the other two products because uh, they're also quite cool in their own right. Tell us about the surfboard. You've attached an electric motor to a surfboard, and you're basically hovering over a lake. Yes, exactly. So it's called, you might have seen them, they're called foils. Um, and it's basically a smaller version of a surfboard on which there is a mast attached to it. And in the water, which you don't see, there's two wings. And so it's um, two carbon fiber wings, one large one in front and a smaller one in the back. So it's as if you're kind of hovering on uh, on two wings, two carbon fiber wings, and it's um, floating about a foot above the water on this mast. And so the 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 traditional sport of foiling is being tracted by kites and wings, which are all wind powered. And so what we wanted to do uh, is bring motor and battery technology to this sport. Now, e-foils already exist. They're simply very expensive you you have the battery which is basically incorporated into the board and it, this is all one big unit and they cost between 12 and fifteen thousand dollars they're they're expensive in their own right and so what we wanted to do is basically electrify the boards of people who already own a quiver of equipment meaning the person going to for example la madeleine or cap hatteras that um goes to the beach and that day the wind isn't so great well if if they if the wind isn't so great there's no real options beside having your own e-foil and people don't usually do that because first of all it's really expensive and then it's it's a huge piece of equipment um it's it's really cumbersome to to uh carry around and so our system basically electrifies a board so instead of putting the 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 battery inside the board we basically built a tiny battery unit that attaches to any board and allows anyone with already a board to electrify it in the event where there's no wind. Excellent. And lastly, can you um, can you tell me how you've electrified the skateboard as well, which is, uh, I guess, your most popular product right now? Yeah. Yeah. So so the, the, the way we've and how we've carved a niche is because we basically we're amongst the first companies to basically design a board to be electrified from the get-go. Instead of simply slapping a battery and a motor on an electric on, on an analog skateboard, we designed the deck and the enclosure for the battery to be electrified from the start. So it gives it a very sleek appearance. And the flex of the board was all thought to be optimal considering that it would have a 20, 25 pound battery under it. So everything is kind of designed to work as one unit instead of being kind of a retrofit, which would, which was done uh, prior to us coming on the market. And uh, this is a really fun company heading into the summer, Mike. Um, electrifying skateboards, the uh, surfboard product, the foil, the e-foil is really interesting. It looks like you're hovering over a lake. And then, of course, the uh, this harpoon product, which is uh, uh, basically like a chairlift that, uh, that extreme skiers can use to uh, get back up the mountain without the use of an actual chairlift for those uh, out in the wild. Just a really fascinating line of sports products. And who knows where it can go, Mike? Um, it's, uh, it's a very innovative company. It's great. I mean, you, you look at it, I have more questions than we're going to have time for today to, to get to, just out of the, the fascination and, and, and what drives us to get there. But I'm going to start with a really basic one. You know, we look at a lot of our guests and, you know, the name of the company is either, you know, based on somebody's name or it's based on something associated with the product. Alex, how did you come up with Lacroix? Yeah, so the, when we started the company in 2018, the... Um, the goal for the first product was for us to be able to go up Camille Oud and go to the cross on the top of the Mount Royal without basically the board imploding. So, um, yeah, and, and we failed a whole bunch of times. There were, a, it, it became Camille Oud back then, which is a, about a mile ish of uphill, um, an uphill road going on to the top of the Mount Royal. Is uh, was quite a challenge for a for a small electric powered personal electric vehicle. 
So, um, so that's how the, the name came up. Yeah. The, the goal was always to go to La Croix and we just, yeah. Right. So you took the, the, the yeah, the, the cross at the top of, uh, of Mount Royal is La Croix or the cross in English. So, uh, fascinating. So it's, you know, we, 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 all, we always need something to aspire to. So that's, uh, that, that was an interesting site. What got you into this? I mean, you're a patent lawyer by trade. I mean, I'm just fascinated how you go from wearing a suit and sitting in an office to finding yourself in, uh, well, I guess at 55 years old, I'll call them extreme sports, even if maybe they're not. So uh, how did this get started? It started by wanting to build a company from the very beginning of my law career. I've, I've I always had the eyes open to join a company, but the opportunities were never never materialized themselves. And uh, but I was always on the lookout because I knew that being a patent lawyer wasn't my true calling. I didn't I didn't love it to be honest. So that's that's basically where it came from. And um, and why these sports? Well, I was I'm you know I'm a skier at heart, mountain biker. I've always practiced all these sports. And then I had a few kids, uh, two kids. And you know, for anyone who's who became a parent, you know that you have much less time. There is no possibility for me to go kite surfing for six hours on a Saturday. It's just not a possibility anymore. So the 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 will to kind of still get those rushes that I got from these sports was still very present and is are still very present today. And that's how I, I built the first electric skateboards to kind of, um, in, in French, we say, joindre l'utile à l'agréable. Uh, and that's how it, it started with the, with the with the e-boards. I love the adrenaline junkie in you. It's awesome. Um, I, I got a good chuckle. I have to admit, going to the website and the beginner's guide and the very first question of the frequently asked question section is, are the boards waterproof? You know, I, I, I can't even imagine some of the questions you may get on some of the products that the fact that they're so out there. Are your customers... I mean, you mentioned it before about how you're attaching a battery. So you've always, obviously, these are existing people. Are you getting a lot of neophytes and a lot of first timers that are coming in to try some of these things, or, or is your let's let's talk a little bit about the market and and your market share and 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 even some digital marketing hiccups. I'm I'm sure you've uh, you've dealt with in in the past little while. Absolutely. So our products, the way we've because we built everything here. Uh, in Quebec, we really carved ourselves a niche as a high end uh, and making the best products with the best materials. So we use carbon fiber. Every screw is made out of titanium. We use 7075 aluminum, which for people who know is uh, very hard. And we don't usually use that uh, alloy of aluminum. And so, we, you know, no expense spared. And that's where our products are really expensive. And our margins are still very slim, despite our, our very high cost. So Given given that, we usually get some people who are already addicted to the sport. You know, there are some first timers that will, but I would say that the majority of our clients have already had some experience with other boards, other brands, and then they're kind of hooked and they don't really love the performance. Either the range is kind of lacking or the speed or the feel is kind of lacking. And so that's how they get into uh, Lacroix boards. Because to be honest, to dish out a many thousands of dollars on a first purchase you kind of really need to know that you you're going to love it and that you're going to maximize your investment and so so usually the the way traditionally people approach it is to have some experience with other boards first um but the that that's not the case with the foil because the foil our our efoil product is you know 4800 where the alternative is 12000 so on that specific product we're actually really cheaper to the alternative so that's where so we're getting a lot of first timers but not first timers of the of foiling per se but more first timers of people who are purchasing an electric foil i would say so basically what you're saying is I better learn to stand up on a regular skateboard before I drop some dough on uh, on something a little more sophisticated. I got gotcha. you. I can still ski, I can snowboard, so I guess the you know it's 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 not it's not going to be popular with me unfortunately. Um you make reference uh in past to uh to the fact that you've got uh, La Croix Australia and uh, La Croix uh, Europe. What what are those? Are they sales offices? Are you doing any manufacturing over there? No, we're not. We're so the um We've been approached from the start. Um, the reason why La Croix was able to carve itself a niche is because we started selling in basically 20, 22 countries from the first year. So we're getting a lot of these 
um, addicts, let's call them that, our clients, they're really, uh, that's what they are. They, they, you know, they love the sport and they, they love the, the sensations that it brings. So, and we were getting orders from all over and we were all, um, manufacturing here in Montreal back then. And, um, now we're in the Laurentians, but back then all in Montreal and shipping individually to all these countries. And so one hurdle that we have by shipping individual boards to, for example, Australia and Europe is the cost, you know, for example, shipping our, our flagship board, the Lone Star Supersport to Australia costs us uh, just as a cost around 600 bucks, um, Canadian. So it, yes, of course, there are some clients that are willing to pay that even if we don't mark it up and, and we don't, you know, the shipping, we tell them, listen, I'm just charging you what I'm being charged. And we have a deal with FedEx and, you know, that's, that's with, that's a good quote unquote, that's a good price. So, so what we found is that by partnering with a local retailer that would actually buy our products by the pallet and then ship them within the, within Australia for, for the countries where basically shipping is a bit prohibitive, such as Europe and Australia made sense for us to have distributors and retailers where we have less margins, of course, but uh, it enables us to to access those countries. So there's no manufacturing that's done over there. All the manufacturing is still done here in the Laurentians, but they they kind of stock our products and ship locally, and they can service them as well. So that's that's the uh, compromise that we've come to with uh, with those two markets. It's a really interesting product, and your customers is, is what I'm wondering about, um, Alex. They don't necessarily all like all the products, right? I mean, some are more land people, others are more water people or ski people. Do you find that your customer base is very different, or are they more similar than different? That's a yeah, very good question. We're still we're still uh, learning on that because the foil product we launched back in the in the fall and the the harpoon the the ski lift we just launched it a few weeks ago, so. I think your reflex is right to think that they are all um, different, you know, probably people with with uh, similar interests, you know, certainly interested in in all the in all the products. But it's it's not obvious at all that the the person um, interested in the ski lift, the harpoon would necessarily be interested in uh, skateboards. I think it's just an overarching interest for sports that bring, you know, flow state and adrenaline. But not not so much um, necessarily uh, cross selling across uh, all the products. Yeah. And continuing on with Alex now. So uh, yeah, those customers, Alex, uh, very different. Uh, certainly doing different things. Do you have any super fans who do everything? Who brag about sort of doing all three? Yeah. So um, yeah, funny you say the 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 way we've grown the company was word of mouth um, up until basically last year. We didn't do any ads. Uh, nothing. And so the the every time we launch a new product, we would actually get a whole bunch of orders simply by the fact that, you know, they 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 bought our one of our products, for example, the foil. Like the first um 30 that we sold were basically um repeat customers from our skateboard business. So it, it but it's I wouldn't say it's representative. I think it's just we have some super fans, some some people who are you know enjoy the fact that we really um go above and beyond to create these products and they know that we're you know our margins are still very slim because the product really speak for themselves and and are very very high quality and so that's why they're interested in any new product that we're going to sell but i wouldn't say it's the uh you know um we're still in the niche of a niche of a niche i would say so yeah that has its limits it, it it brings a very interesting point. I mean, like you said, it was word of mouth. I mean, traditionally, uh, anything involved in the surf and the skateboard community was a very close knit, tight group. Uh, and I and I and I can see how that you know how you could feed within that environment. What are the objectives here of Lacroix going forward? What are you looking to grow? And and how do you get outside of, you know, outside of the the niche of the niche of the niche? Like, what what is the objective here? Um, I don't. I don't think the objective is to go outside of the the niche. Um, I think the objective is to keep cultivating it, and by by innovating, that's really how we've kept our head above the water for all these years, and how I see the future of the company. Now, the the skateboards are a great, great platform. Uh, they're very powerful. Um, and I, I see a lot of future in adapting them for different um, environments, such as sand and snow 
and um, mountains. Right now, our boards are very at ease on the tarmac, on asphalt, um, with, you know, eight inch inflatable tires, but they're not so great when you go um, in, in um, off-road uh, in the mountains. So having some sort of a suspension on them is definitely something we're in the works. Being able to adapt and having a skateboard in the summer and with a few attachments and five minutes and a few tools to be able to use it in deep snow in the winter is definitely something I'm looking into. So that is something that will be. Um, yeah. So it's more about adapting and keeping innovating and using the platform that we've built to um, multiply the experiences that all these people love uh, more than anything else, I would say. Yeah, I, I think if you, once you once you stay in that niche market, I mean, you obviously you're limiting the number of people that are you're going to bring in. So you really have to be creative, and you really have to continue to do, you know, the mental and the physical R and D that's associated with taking the existing products to a new level. Um, and anybody that's that, that, that plays in this space wants to get to a new level. This is not a space of people who are you know happy with yesterday's product. So there's a lot of energy and a lot of time that comes. How how do you? I mean, is this just brainchild? Of of, uh, of you guys or you know when are you getting feedback from customers and saying hey we would like to see this we would like to do that how do you how do you decide where to go yeah that's um interesting no it's not feedback from anyone it's uh it's very you know they, they say that when you you start a business you should really scratch your own itch and that's basically what it is i really make products that i would want to ride and love riding and if, that don't exist basically so that's how we've we've done it from from the start um luckily now i'm i'm surrounded with a team of really bright people that are able to execute on uh, the ideas that we have and then we we kind of bounce them and and uh, optimize them and see how we can bring them to reality but uh, but at the core of it, um, no, we, we don't do uh, any um, surveys or anything. It's more about like, well, why don't we try this? And, you know, that doesn't exist. And we could probably do this fairly easily. And, you know, kind of, and then the idea gets going. So is there actually a marketing strategy or is this you guys developing? And then, you know, <laughs> that thinking, is a marketing strategy. I, huh? I know it is. I mean, you're making a market, right? You're making a market and then basically inviting people in, which is, which in and of itself is a, is a fascinating approach. Um, so, you know, I don't know how much of the marketing you can impose, uh, you can impart on our, our, our audience who are used to doing marketing for, a, you know, marketing marketable product. But I find this fascinating. I mean, you're creating a market, you're you're following the niche, uh, you're sitting in a space. And, you know, funny enough, and I know it has nothing, well, not nothing to do, but relative to, I can I can sit and watch a hundred foot uh, wave and, you know, and, and just think about the niche mindset of people that are involved in that and how, like you said, how do you scratch that itch? So it's, it's fascinating. Yeah, it's, it's, um, it's certainly building aspirational uh, marketing around our products is something that we're um, going to be working on because, you know, that hundred foot wave, there's only a handful of people in the world that could actually um, ride it. But once you go into the ocean, the board under their feet is probably very similar to the guy that actually riding the hundred foot wave and the weekend warrior. So, um, so that's, that's definitely exactly the niche that we're, that we're hitting is, is people who still aspire and are inspired by all these athletes who are constantly pushing the boundaries, but don't want to put their lives at risk. And, and we're building basically products for for those people. It's very well, well, very cool. I think, I think Dan is just fascinated that I even know what the hell a hundred foot wave is. <laughs> I'm, 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 I can't wait to test out one of the products this summer and uh, spending about half my time in the Laurentians, Alex, I wonder how you guys are inspired by the place because you have this story about being inspired by the mountain, but then you sort of open things up in the Laurentians, you have all this more space to develop more products. Have you been further inspired by, by just the, the region? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. With, without the... Um, so we, we, we have a um, 350... 365 acre piece of land, which which is basically our laboratory right now, on which the harpoon was entirely developed. And there's a, a 16 island lake about a minute from the um, from the shop that we built. And so th these two combination of having this beautiful um, lake and the mountain is is really just uh, the perfect environment to be developing these products. So yeah, being in the Laurentian, I mean. 
But put, let's put it the other way. If I was still in the Mile End, um, in you know, on Casgrain, in this old, uh, uh, you know, high rise in twelve hundred square foot, I mean, the, the the new products would never have been developed, and we we probably wouldn't wouldn't be talking today. So no, it's it's been instrumental in the uh, in the development of the company. We'll have the one piece of advice for inspiring entrepreneurs from our adventurous entrepreneur, Alexandre Alchambault of La Croix Boards, that is on the way. But first, let's check in with our expert and talk about R&D, especially what uh, tax credits are available for innovative companies like La Croix. Carlo Lupo is tax partner at BDO Canada. Welcome back, Carlo. Thank you for having me again. I, I just want to say the article was interesting, and my experience with skateboards was a split chin when I was about seven years old back in 1985. Oh no! Well, hopefully Lacroix is, uh, is solving that with a with a smarter skateboard, Mike, and uh, one which is innovative, and and maybe they they could qualify for some interesting grants as well because they are doing things that are good for the environment too. Most definitely, the scientific research and experimental development tax credits, more commonly known as Shred, uh, Carlo, maybe uh, maybe bring us a little bit up to date of what's been going on. I mean, these have been around for quite some time, but have morphed, changed, and and been limited, and then upticked uh, a, a few times, and certainly in my career. So, yeah, uh, great point. Um, you know, I, I found his uh, discussion on the business quite interesting, and uh, and for any businesses in Quebec that are undertaking. Um, development of new products, researching, because it, it sounded as if there was a lot of thought process and energy that went into this. Know that for uh, businesses in Quebec, private corporations undertaking shred, uh, there is a 30 percent, um, uh, sorry, 35 percent uh, federal tax credit and 30 percent uh, Quebec tax credit. So total 65 percent, uh, very lucrative on the first three million dollars of qualifying expenditures. Um, for those corporations that are not private, you're down to 29 percent um still lucrative so it's it's a very interesting uh area to look for for free money uh, and especially since it it funds uh the the endeavor that uh, the businesses are looking to undertake yeah, Quebec has been a hotbed of innovation over the years, large part fueled by the Canadian and the Quebec uh, shred environment of things. So I think a lot of companies have, have, have certainly extended and been able to do. There's also something else out that's called the Tax Credit for Investment and Innovation, or commonly referred to as 3CI tax credits. Um, how does that fit in? So that's a, a Quebec credit uh, that's ex uh, that's exclusive to Quebec. Um, it, it's a uh, it's there to encourage investment in um, uh, manufacturing in computers. Um, and the credit range is currently right now from twenty to forty percent, depending on the economic vitality zone. Um, and that is set to expire uh, at the end of 2023, at which point the credit will then go down to 10 to 20 percent. So anyone looking to undertake the acquisition of manufacturing equipment, computer equipment, now is the time to look at it because the, the, the rate is uh, very beneficial. So a lot of times when you get into the R&D side of things, uh, you know, we, we don't always have the necessary experts here. So often we end up bringing in foreign research uh, and experts uh, with this has been very popular in the pharmaceutical industry, for example. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there, there are tax holidays or tax credits that are available. Maybe maybe run us through a little bit of that. So for um, a, a foreign specialist uh, uh, that you'd want to bring in to do SHRED, which is specifically scientific research and experimental development, there is a tax holiday in Quebec uh, set over a series of five years. So any salary that uh, is being paid to them in Quebec will be exempted from tax uh, based on a, a set percentage. So this is actually lucrative if you're looking, if you can't find someone here, but you know there's someone outside of Canada, you can bring them to Quebec, do the research here, and it doesn't cost them much in terms of tax uh, per, at the personal level. I mean, I, maybe this is not a topic for you, but I mean, bringing people into this country is not always the easiest thing from from a visa perspective. Um, for a lot of these exercises, are are, are they using uh, immigration lawyers in in order to facilitate these uh, these work visas, or is this something that a company can do itself? I it, I think it depends on the size of the company whether they have the resources internally to do so or not. That is definitely a, uh, an issue that needs to be looked at. One of the things I need to mention is that in order to qualify for the exemption, there is an attestation that is required to certify that the person is a qualified foreign researcher. Carla Lupo, tax partner at BDO Canada. Thanks so much, Carla. 
My pleasure. And as we come to the end of our show, let's turn to our entrepreneur, Alex Archambault of La Croix Boards and ask him for his one piece of advice for inspiring entrepreneurs. Alex, what do you think? Yeah, the uh, well, this has been said by I, I, I at least remember uh, Steve Jobs saying it. So it's, it, it doesn't come from me, but it's it's um, it's certainly true for any entrepreneur, I think, who's who's been doing it for long enough is um uh, persistence. Uh, you know, the the only difference between uh, a failing entrepreneur, and, well, you know, most of the time and a successful one is simply persistence. And, you know, knowing that there will be, it's it's definitely going to be the hardest thing that you've ever done. So if, if it's not the hardest thing that you've ever done, then it's going to come. <laughs> You're going to come at one point where you're going to be in the in in you know a, a period of your life where everything seems like it's so complicated and and um and and you're going to ask yourself why you did it well at that point just keep on hammering and uh and you'll get through it but um i guess that uh being persistent and and believing in your vision and not um letting go uh is is the single piece of advice i would give you yeah. know Thanks so much, Alex and Mike. Just a really great example of uh, a business that is adventurous. I mean, just just really, uh, th there's an adventurous spirit there, an innovative spirit behind Lacroix. Most definitely, and and you know, the, some of the things that stood out through all of this to me is, you know, this is a homegrown Quebecois company that's building and manufacturing here. That's inspired by the landscape and the Laurentians, and 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 you know, it's just it it doesn't get much more you know home based than than this. But you're feeding into a high-end market, and even more impressive is you know the, the confidence to make your own market, and, and and I think you know from an entrepreneurial standpoint, you know, you know people have said uh, for years that you border on there's a there's a borderline between confidence and arrogance, uh, and I think you need a little bit of both, and I think especially if you're going to try and make a market like Alex and his team are doing, so this is uh, this is fascinating. Alex, have you tried the board along the Petit Trains du Nord? That must be a lot of fun. Yes, it is. Yeah, it's, um, it's, I mean, you need to be respectful. That's what I say to anyone on, you know, novel products is always be mindful of being of the people around you don't ride uh, carelessly and recklessly just be, you know, it's, uh, you want people to ask questions and to be a curiosity and people to be, you know, interested, not be frustrated by how you're actually behaving yourself on these novel products. So that's, that's always what I advocate is uh, being respectful. And, uh, but uh, yeah, the, the Petit Train du Nord is, uh, or the Corrida Aerobic. And yeah, any, the sense of freedom that you get by by going out there is definitely second to none. I got to I got to assume Alex that the the respect level for the environment and, and and everything around is equally, if not more important, than the fact that you know you're pushing the extremes of nature. Uh, that you know we weren't necessarily intended to push the way we're pushing, and and we we just have to respect the environment and the and and the terrain and and everything else. It's 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 fascinating. Yeah, the the harpoon is really the um, the pinnacle of, of that idea i would say because creating um setting up your own ski lift on basically any given mountain and being able to wrap it up at the end of the day and go away with it without anybody knowing that you know you actually were there not leaving a single trace um yeah i'm, I'm still i'm still uh, a little shocked every time uh, we, we we do it that we were able to you know maximize our day ski 10 runs on this beautiful you know um uh, mountain or or um, uh, a peak of a mountain and and just leave as if we weren't we weren't there so yeah it's, it's definitely ingrained not, not to mention the saving on the environmental side between a helicopter or a plane or whatever it is to get you up to heli ski and do whatever i mean there's just a massive amount of of good things that you're doing so this is this is great great job Alex. Yeah, Thanks so much, you're Alex. definitely looking into our future there. Yeah, replacing helicopters in the mountains, that's that's the goal. But we're probably seven to ten years away from that. Yeah. Cool. Thanks, guys. It was a pleasure being here. A reminder, you can subscribe to Inspiring Entrepreneurs Montreal as a podcast on iHeartRadio, Apple, or your favorite platform. And you can also log on to the website, inspiringentrepreneursmtl.com, for hundreds of local entrepreneur profiles. Our season finale is next week, and we'll have a surprise guest. Stay tuned.